Yes, let's make a start. Can I ask you the first question? Would that be okay, Lindsay? Let's do it, Joe. Let's do it, let's do it. And this is a question that we get asked so much. So I'm just gonna throw it straight to you. We're talking mm -hmm. about leadership. We're talking about authentic um, leadership. First question, what team roles do you need to be a good leader? <laughs> Joe, I get this one all the time. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Um, yeah. With people uh, looking for a prescription or a silver bullet or a, a little a, a plug and play for how to be the best leader and how to be the best leader that ever was. And we've got this, this saying that we use all the time that I'm, I'm stealing from my boss, Max. That is, it's, it's, if you think about playing cards, it's not about the cards that you're dealt, but it's how you play your hand. So rather than saying you have to have a prescribed set of team roles in order to be an effective leader, we like to say you're actually going to be more effective figuring out what your top strengths are, what cards you have in your deck, and then figuring out how to play them in the most effective way, both for your own effectiveness and then also to supercharge your team as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. So it's not saying actually to be a great leader, you need to have this team role, this team role, and this team role. It's Absolutely. No, no, no. Where are your cards? Where are your strengths? It's how you're playing those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that being said, Joe, there's a couple of roles, um, as you know, that lean more towards that leadership mm -hmm. style. Um, the two that often come to mind first are the coordinator role, which is the more people-y side of leadership, where we've got that um, bigger picture outlook. We're always aligning people towards the goals, and someone really strong at coordinator is gonna, gonna leverage the talents on their teams very effectively, keep everyone motivated and seeing how their work points towards the goals of what the team is trying to accomplish. Whereas on the, on the other side of things, we've got the shaper style of leadership, which is the more action or results orientation. And this style of leadership, as you well know, is going to bring more of that energy, that sense of urgency, and that drive to get things done with that amazing ability to overcome any barriers or obstacles that are in the way so that the team can get to the results that it needs. Okay, so you've got those two, but... They're more historical, would you say? They're... Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people say, you know, oh, I, I want to be a better leader. I better just have this yeah. shape or characteristic. And some organizations, they really do have a bit of a norm in their leadership style towards one or the other. Or, oh, um, my first mentor was this great coordinator leader, so I better be with them. And I think there's a lot of skills in that, in that shaper style or in that coordinator style of leadership or even a combination of the two mm -hmm. that can really help you with your, with your leadership aspect. But it doesn't mean that those have to be your very number one or number two roles. So, you know, we, we talked about my top roles here being the top two being plant specialists. And those for me are so strong that that idea of, um, burning down the status quo to find new ways of looking at things with that plant leaning. And then with the specialist, the wanting to go deep and then share it with others and share that knowledge with others, empower others with the knowledge. That combination for me, no matter what I try to do with my leadership roles, is still going to come out. It's almost like I can't turn it off. So what I need to do is figure out how to leverage this in the best way to, to actually meet my goals. And I think that's, that's a really important um, umbrella to start to add into this discussion, is that whatever changes you're looking at making from a, what you learned from a Belvin report and you, you wanna change your behavior, any of these behavioral changes, if they're not helping you meet your bigger picture goals, then, then what are they in service of? So, so we always say this Belvin stuff is, is super helpful, gives you tons of insights, to point you towards meeting your goals in, in a more effective way. So how can you figure out how to tactically play to your strengths in a way that is going to help you meet your goals better? I love that because it's really giving that work element, isn't it, to Belvin? You know, the fact is that it's mm -hmm. a practical tool and it's something you should use to help you regardless of what that goal may be. So if we're looking at it through a, a leadership lens, I need to be a more effective leader. Yeah. So you're thinking about how can I use my Belvin team role report? How can I use my strengths and weaknesses to become the better leader? As opposed to saying, yeah. what do I need to be to be a better leader? There's a slight, there's a nuance there, isn't there? 
Agreed, agreed. And I think that the first starting point for anyone, especially if you're new to Belvin, is finding out what those strengths actually are. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love the most about, about the Belvin system is that you can see what you think your top strengths are, but then you can also get an insight into what other people think your top strengths are. Yeah. And for a, a lot of people, yeah, <laughs> there can be a really big um, learning or discovery yeah. there uh, because a lot of us have things that we do naturally really well that we take for granted and that we don't recognize is mm -hmm. a way that we can be more effective or help the team more. And so, so I always say to people that my favorite, favorite thing about Belden is that it can often help people find out hidden strengths that they didn't even know they had. And that's powerful, isn't it? That is really yeah. powerful stuff. And that's where that sort of growth mindset comes in as well, doesn't it? Is that we, Absolutely. and I think, I think it was um, in a conversation that I had um, with Max Isaacs, you know, and um, over in Melbourne, North America. And he mentioned it's, it's the fact that we have this cholesterol check, don't we? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm going to tell a story that you've kind of told me, and you know, it's the wrong thing to do. But, you know, it's a case of, we go to the doctors to get our cholesterol check to see, you know, where we are. The same as you do with a bell, where am I right now? Yeah. You get advice, you get told what to do, you need, tend to go away, you get told to exercise and all of those things. But then you go back and check it again, don't you? And this is what we need to do with Belbin is we need to say, where are we now? But not just from our perspective, but from everybody else's perspective as well. And then Absolutely. that is growth. Where are those differences? How can I work on those differences? Wow, I may have not... I may have strengths I never knew I had and to be able to bring that all to the conversation. And that's the one thing about Belden that I, I think most leaders that I work with find the most useful is that it's actually measurable. So mm. we can actually measure your behaviors and we can actually measure and see if they're changing over time. So, yeah. you know, when I mentioned earlier that I'd done a new Belden mm. earlier this year, I had some things that I was working on, possibly maybe being a bit territorial with that specialist leading. <laughs> and I wanted to see how it was tracking. I wanted to check in just like going and getting a blood test. You know, have I changed my behaviors enough to help my health in this regard? Have I changed my behaviors enough that others are perceiving my behaviors in a different way? So you can actually get very tactical about what behaviors do I, do I want to do some mm -hmm. tweaking on? And, and am I having an impact over time by, by using, using the Belbin to actually measure this? No, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got lots of questions coming in, but I think we're okay at the moment because actually most of them that are coming, I know that we're going to answer in the next five or 10 okay. minutes. So um, <laughs> don't worry. I, 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 we will be answering them. Don't worry at all. Okay. So we're talking about finding out our strengths. We're talking about how can we use our strengths through the, the window of leadership as opposed to saying, I yeah. need to be this to become a leader. How can I use what I've already got to be able to come a great leader and this comes a lot doesn't it because um i've actually recorded a few um webinars for other people recently so that they can show people who've been told you need to be a leader <laughs> about you know and you can see people are, i don't know what to do how, how do i do that and it's a case of actually just 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 sit for a minute you know find out your strengths use those and yeah. help you become but you need to be your own leader and i think this is quite crucial isn't it it's not becoming a blueprint what you think a leader should be. Absolutely. And, you know, Joe, I do a lot of coaching with um, either people who are new in a leadership role and maybe they were promoted um, because they were really excellent at getting stuff done. Yeah. But they don't necessarily have leadership skills because it's a new arena for them. And and so they, you know, I get on a, on a coaching conversation with them and it's, okay, um, you can be very effective as an individual putting your head, head down, getting the stuff done. Now, how do we leverage that into actually helping others on your team to help make them more effective as well? Um, and then when I'm talking with more experienced leaders, um, the, the thing that I find really makes the crucial difference is does the leader have an ability or a willingness to learn? Because that's what's going to make the difference. There's a lot of people that, that I kind of, I've seen with almost like a crossed arms posture, I already know who I am, I'm not going to make a change, this is what I bring to the table. And I think there is, you know, sometimes there's a power to, to knowing who you are. But one of the things that, that I'm really seeing um, turbo drive <laughs> leaders to success is this, is this 
openness and, and a willingness to, to learn and then change some of these behaviors. And what I like about the belt and meshing with that is that it can often start a conversation with people in a way that doesn't promote defensiveness. So with the Belbin, we're not saying you're good or you're bad, or this is, this is something you're terrible at, or you need to fix X, Y, Z. The perspective we're more trying to come at is here's a bunch of things you already do really well. Is there a way that you can be more tactical, more strategic, and actually put a plan into place? To say, I'm going to take the strengths that I've got, whether I knew about them or I've just discovered about them, um, and I'm going to actually put them in a really uh, strategic, tactical way to, to, to increase my effectiveness. You know, when I talk to leaders, they always have a strategic plan. There's a strategic plan in place. They've set it out for the next six years. They know what their path is. They've got an execution plan. Yeah. They know what's happening Q1, Q2. They're on top of every detail. And then I say to them, well, do you have an interaction plan? How are you, how are you going to deal with this people stuff, this behavior stuff? And most leaders just don't have a plan in place. And, and there's some things that we can do that, that might not be easy, but they're definitely simple to put into place to say, look, here's some ways that we can, we can target working on your behaviors in a very strategically oriented way. Wow. So you sit down, so, but it starts with knowing your behaviors in the first place, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, and getting that um, insight into not just what you think your behaviors are, but what others see as well. So I often, when I show people their, their observer assessment on, mm -hmm. their, on their Belbin, saying, you know, you've done, you, you know, you've got your strengths. You know what you think you're good yeah. at. But let's start looking at almost like a, a brand survey. I work with a lot of marketing execs. And so this really resonates with them to think, um, what's, what's your brand right now? What brand are you, Joe, putting out to the universe? We did a survey and we got back these responses and the world thinks that your strengths are um, seeing new opportunities, driving change, being a force of energy, bringing all that to the table. Um, is that brand that the universe is seeing aligned with where you want your brand to be? in order to be the most successful. I and are there that changes brand. that we want to make along the way? Yeah, I love that. Sorry, that, that whole concept of your personal brand, it yeah. really it helps. It just sounds better than feedback, doesn't it? Um, you know, you're wanting to understand your impact and, and the brand that you're, you're putting out there. I, I love that. Um, I think it might be a good idea if we um, show a report at this point, perhaps. Absolutely. Let me see what this I happen like. to have mine ready. Imagine yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I just say, can I just say at this point, say, this is what you call no, no. authentic leadership because I said to Lindsay, do you want to use mine? <laughs> I said, do you want to use our start standard sample report? And she said, no, if I'm prepared to speak about it, I need to use my own. So I just like to say thank you for that. <laughs> so, so here's me and all, all of my, my, my glory. Um, you know, Joe, one of the things we were talking about in our, in our call last week was that you don't have to have coordinator or shaper in your top three to actually still play that role. And I think that could be a really interesting kind of tweak for people to know that they might have coordinator, or shaper, leadership, official strengths, but that they can lead from a position of their strengths that might not be those top two roles. Um, and you'll see, for example, in my report here, <laughs> that um, I believe that my top strengths plant specialist coordinator um, fairly nicely validated by the people that I work with after, after all these years of doing lots of work on self-awareness and understanding what my strengths are and, and kind of trying to actually put these interaction plans into place for myself. Um, but this idea of, of what you bring to the table and knowing does what you put out into the world match with what others see as well and then finding where some of these, these interesting differences are and deciding what you're going to do with them as well. 
So what we've got here for Lindsay, we've got her self-perception. So we've got it from one to nine. So you plant her top role, she feels as her top role. Then we go down to specialist, coordinator, resource investigator, so on teamwork, a bottom role. And then we have the people who've observed you. And of course, one question to ask at this point as well is what relationship do you have with everybody? What working relationship do you have with everybody who's observed you? And they're giving their feedback. What are they seeing? What's the brand that they're picking up on? Mm -hmm. And then you have that, that overall composition there uh, which is taking all of that information into a, account and saying this these are your strengths you know this is yeah. this is Lindsay where YCF completed finisher has now come at the bottom there because I see that's at the bottom there whereas you have plant specialist there at the top but like you say it's knowing that and then knowing how to use that to lead isn't it and um yeah, and, and knowing, Joe, where any matchup happens between what I see and where my observers might see it a little differently. So I always say to people, this is my favorite page in a Belden report. Um, I casually call it the coherence page because we're checking in to see how much your view of your strengths aligns with others. And you can see, you know, this is probably Belden number eight for me over mm -hmm. the years. So there are some things that are very nicely aligned and there are some things that I'm thinking, oh, maybe I do have more strength in this monitor evaluator or even the teamwork one I was talking about earlier. You know, I see that as zero. I've got no skills in this teamwork area. And my team is saying, guess what? I think you bring a little bit of this <laughs> to the table. I think you and do. we, yeah, when we're, when we're talking with our, our leaders about this, um, we've got this saying that we use, it's saying it's like you have a Ferrari in the garage. So, <laughs> right, you've got this asset that is going to waste or could be going to waste. And if you only knew about it, you could be bringing more of that to help the team to be most, both, both more effective at, you know, your own individual level, but then to, to supercharge your team up with that skill as well. No, that's wonderful, isn't it? It's, it's really finding out yeah, those hidden strengths. And if you're going to be an effective look, you need to know this. You've got to start from a Absolutely. position of knowledge. You've got to start from a position of understanding how you're coming across to others, because otherwise it's, it can't be particularly authentic, one would say. If, you're, if your self-perception, if your understanding of yourself, if your self-awareness is quite low, mm. you need to know right early on to be, you know, to be able to come as effective as possible. So getting this observer feedback, finding out your, not just your hidden strengths, but also strengths that other people are seeing. Um, Absolutely. It's crucial information. And Joe, I often have people saying to me that they feel like selfish or self-indulgent to go and work on bringing up strengths in their report, mm -hmm. which that's not my natural mindset. So it, all, it, it took me by surprise the first few times I heard it. Um, and, and a way that I like to look at it is that strength that you're not playing to, um, that you do have, could be a lost asset for the team. So you would never um, buy a new software package, install it on your entire organization's computers, go through all the training, spend the subscription price for your, your support model, and then say to people, oh, don't bother using it next year. We spent all this money, but you know, just ignore it. You would never say, you would never say that. And you know, when you did your budget review the next year, you'd say, why are we paying for this software? Like this, this makes no sense to us. And, and so if you think about these strengths in this way, there's a similar idea that you're bringing an asset to your team and you are a resource. You are, you are an investment for, for your organization. And if you don't play to your strengths, if you don't play to your powerhouse, it's like someone's paid for a software package that they're just Amazing. not using. That's really powerful, isn't it? No, that is wonderful. Thank you. I mean, somebody's commented here that there may be hidden strengths, but, but perceived by themselves, they may be perceived as being difficult or they might be perceived as being weaknesses. And that's tr Absolutely. true, isn't it? I think that comes up quite a lot. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, I think you have to map all this back, as we were saying before, to your goals. 
So if you say to me, okay, you've got this hidden monitor evaluator strength and you need to go work more on your monitor evaluator skill set. I try really hard not to be prescriptive when I'm doing any coaching sessions with my leaders, because the thing that you want to do is make sure that it's also work that they enjoy doing and that is going to get them towards their goals. Mm -hmm. So for me right now, I've got, I need to put more mental time into leveraging my coordinator skills to help my team in the current position that I'm in. The monitor evaluator skill set isn't so much of one that's going to be useful with the current climate and the current goals and the current what I'm trying to achieve. That doesn't mean it's not something that I should pay attention to and be aware of, but I can be very tactically focused on the things that are actually going to get me more engaged and to make me of more use to my team. Yeah, no, that is wonderful. And this sort of goes on, actually, it's a got a few questions and now I just want to put a couple of them to you if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so Rod has asked, how do you take that strong shape a leader and broaden their skill set, their mindset? And I think this is almost demonstrated a little bit just by the graph in itself that we're not just one thing. Um, Absolutely. We've got so much more we, could, we can draw upon. But again, yeah. it's, I mean, how would you, how would you answer that, Lindsay? Yeah, you know, I would go back to that idea of the playing cards again. So you probably have more than one card in your hand. You probably have more than one role. So I've got this big plant thing going on, but I've got other roles that I can play too as well. And so when I'm chatting with my leaders, the thing that I'm helping them find is what cards do you actually have in your hand? And can you be very clear about what card you're going to play at which time? Um, or to use another metaphor, because I'm in the visual mode today, um, what hat are you going to wear in which situation? So, you know, when I'm working with my exec team, we don't have anyone strong at the shaper role. And, and I'm probably the, the middly person on the shaper role. So we have a clear ground room place saying, Lindsay, when you're with this team, could you bump up that shaper? Could you put your shaper hat on for the day so that we bring that sense of urgency, that sense of drive, and we get things done on the team? But when we're not with the exec team and I'm with my other folks that I work with, um, that's not the way that they best respond. So I kind of have to take my shaper hat off, put on my coordinator hat, and bring them more alignment towards the big picture, alignment towards the goals, helping them understand how the, what the work that they're doing prioritizes and fits in with the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. So having that versatility or that knowledge of which, which card are you playing when or which hat are you going to wear in which situation is, I think, you know, this key, like we talk about situational leadership, mm -hmm. knowing how your behaviors are going to bounce off other people in your sphere of influence and, and when to play each role to, to greatest effect. So if I come back to this, um, someone's got high shaper uh, in, their, in their toolbox. I think, okay, that is a great skill set to have in leadership. What other cards do you have in your toolbox? Because mm -hmm. Joe, you and I know that the combinations of roles are yeah. often going to make a bigger difference than just the roles individually themselves. So, you know, if, if I happen to know someone who leans shaper, but with a healthy dose of resource investigator as well, which is going to have that double energy orientation um, you have a you have a superpower so I, I use this this phrase from the the Marvel Comics universe um, from spider-man which is with great power comes great responsibility so you've got a superpower of resource investigator shaper whirlwind of energy you're gonna drive Ooh. stuff forward you're gonna lead change people are gonna feel excited motivated engaged to be in your presence they're gonna get that burst of energy um, but that whirlwind of energy is a double-edged sword right so we've got the flip side of the coin of what's the responsibility <laughs> of knowing that you move through the world as a double whirlwind of energy how can you leverage your strengths in the most effective way to say okay I don't just have this shaper I've got this shaper resource investigator and what am I going to do with that combination to be the most successful Lindsay I love that I love that mainly because I've got a 14 year old who's obsessed with Marvel and I suddenly thought oh. <laughs> thought I was at home for a second <laughs> there but this is so true and I think the crucial thing is we're not just one team role it's about learning 
uh, we're all a beautiful mix of nine, aren't we? And yeah. we do yeah. not want to talk about a shaper, a coordinator at this because we are a combination. We don't want to box people in. Yeah. I have that superpower of resource investigator shaper. I'd be interested yeah. to know, because there's lots of chat going on at the moment. If you've done your, if you've got a Belbin report, especially if you've got feedback from others, looking at your top two, knowing your top two roles, and of course it is also about like your third and your fourth and your fifth, but we haven't got all day. In the chat box, tell us what your superpower is. Yeah. Share your superpowers with us. Let's find what we've got here too. Leslie is, oh, also shape of resource investigators. So Leslie and I would have to know that if we were to work together, we would just be a double whirlwind. What's the negative of that as well, doesn't it? We've got um, Derek, plant RI. Okay, so if you're plant RI, what would be your superpower? Double energy around ideas. ideas. Yeah, so you'd be the ideas just coming through, but actually what responsibility do you have? Um, and that would be a case of, Lots of ideas, but to to know that you're just scattering them everywhere, yeah, and to know and that then, they're just going everywhere. What what's the impact on the team if that's where, where your superpower is? And to play them the most effectively, knowing when you bring those ideas in. So if you're in the upfront stages of a project, I see this combo a lot. The resource investigator plant roles are great when you're in brainstorming mode, when you're making the world bigger, when you're saying, what are the ideas that could exist? What are the opportunities that are on the table? What are the new innovative ways to, to break the mold and break the box of what we've got? What can we bring? If you bring that at that point in time, you're going to bring you know, possibly the, the company saving idea to the table. Yeah. If you bring those a little later in the process, it actually could be disruptive. So if the team's already launched on how am I going to activate on this project because we've decided on an idea, we've put it into place, we've vetted it with our strong monitor evaluator skills, we've got a good project plan from the implementer coordinator folks, we've got this, this structure, we're going, we're on the project. If you now bring in a new idea, you could uh, upend the apple cart, as it were. So yeah. knowing when to play those strengths and when to say, okay, I might have to shift into another role. This is when I've got coordinator in my top three or I've got teamwork or whatever the role happens to be. You flip into another role to leverage it at the right time so that your contributions are best heard as well. And I think this is the crucial bit, isn't it? It's to be truly as a strong leader, it's knowing when you're playing each role. It's known for what situation mm -hmm. and not just playing it regardless. It's being able to Absolutely. adapt. It's being able to use your, I suppose, emotional intelligence to know what's needed and always in the yeah. line with the goal. I've just got, a, well, we've got loads. I think everybody has got a Belbin team or profile in front of them. Um, Donna Hello. has implementer coordinator. So we've got amazing organizational ability. This is just your, your superpower is organization, whether or not it be people or the work, isn't it? So wherever you are, work is going to be done and people know what they're going to be them. doing i mean that's just fabulous um we've also got what about completer finisher implementer thank you aldrich what would mm. that power be that's that's double get her done yeah. you can count on this person to get the job done i work with a few people like this and man they save my bacon every day of the week because <laughs> you say, help i need help executing this and not only are they going to get it done, they're going to get it done before the deadline. And when you go to them to say, hey, how are we tracking for that project on Friday? They'll say, I put it in your Dropbox last week. I mean, it's, it's done. And it's always done with the complete or finisher sense to those really high yeah, standards. Yeah, you know you haven't so got to double check it. It's done. Yeah, yeah. no, it's Absolutely. done. It's so done you don't and need it's to double check well. that at all. You can count on it, yeah. I love that. Um, we've also got team worker coordinator. So that's... Oh, wonderful. That's I work with one of these. <laughs> it's a whole cart of empathy as a superpower, Absolutely. isn't it? Yeah, you really care about people um, at both the individual one-on-one -on -one level, and then you care about people's motivations and leveraging the talents that they bring and building them up. And that superpower of empathy, again, like all of them, is the double-edged sword. You really care about your people. That's going to that's gonna have a, a knock-on effect for you as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think this is a great exercise, actually, for those of you who are trainers or in HR or whatever, is get people when they've got their bubble reports with them. Talk about your superpowers, share what they can be, look at the combination and also notice where and when they are best played. Because there's nothing yeah. worse than playing your Spider-Man when, in fact, Spider-Man ain't needed. Um, I can't yeah. think of any more analogies because I, I, yeah, no. but <laughs> I think it's a really, really great um, example. Just for those who've just joined us, actually, um, any questions that you have for us, can you please put in the Q&A and not the chat to make sure that I see it? Because the chat's just gone mad with everybody excited about sharing um, their <laughs> particular team. So I'm going to copy and paste all of that. Don't worry, I'll send it out. And perhaps I could put together a, a, a superpower um article or something which will have everything in there um, you know joe we do have in the belden itself a bit of an insight into your superpowers if you haven't figured them out yet pray so, tell i know <laughs> if you flip over to our lovely work styles page um the report actually starts to give you insight into your superpowers and what i love about this is like you were saying it doesn't put you in a box yeah. And it starts to talk about instead of you are a plant, you are a specialist, what's your work style? What's, what's the verb of what you do rather than the noun of who you are? And I love this with this idea. When, when I look at plant specialist as a combo for me, for example, the report says I have a, a work style of researching. And I can use this catchphrase to share that with others to say, I find that study can often lead to new ideas. And if that is not me to a T, I don't know what is. I have a real need to make sure that I get all of the information that's out there in order to then be innovative. So I need a certain amount of detail orientation from that specialist role and comfort that I've understood the realm that I'm in to then be able to leverage my creativity and, and bring it to the table. And knowing that about myself and knowing that's a superpower that I bring to the table um, has really helped me because, you know, you think there's a, I don't know how many books on Amazon there are about how to be creative, right? Or how to be a good leader. And just like this, there's no, there's no one answer for how to do this. But the idea is, can you figure out how to start to think about your roles in combination to be the most effective? Wow. So everybody needs to turn to this and we need to do a Marvel style yeah. perhaps um, for this page. But I think this is really, really useful. Um, I personally love this page. I use it not necessarily in the leadership setting, but when working with a team, when they're about to start a project and I say, everybody yeah. turn to this page. Are we all... <laughs> being allocated to the right part of the project are we all um, being used properly but there's a another way of doing it okay crikey i'm sorry it's just people are still talking about their strength this is absolutely wonderful so let's just recap a little bit here yeah. so what we're talking about is there is no team role combination that's more effective as being a leader than others there is you shouldn't be looking to change your behavioral strengths to become the ship ideal because there is no mm -hmm ideal we do find that sometimes the shape of coordinator roles that come more naturally but it doesn't matter if they're not in your top roles because what we need to be able to do is look at the cards as you said that we have dealt and the key thing is well actually the first thing is knowing what those cards are and that's not just coming from us but it's coming from other people by asking for that feedback so knowing what cards yeah. we have and how we can play these to become more effective leaders. And that's about being authentic because you're not trying to be something you ain't. It's understanding yeah. what cards you have and playing those to be a far more effective leader. And the key thing in there is that continuous learning. This isn't just you full stop walk away. Yeah. Is it? This is a thing that's going on um, constantly there. And I think just to re-emphasize, and there's a few questions that says, you know, what is it for this team or what about that team or well we're not just one we are a wonderful combination so looking at those combinations is really really important because otherwise we become one trick ponies don't we we allow ourselves to be defined just by one thing which we're not because we're all wonderfully complicated human beings I'd love you to talk to me a little bit more about versatility, though, um, Lindsay, about you talked about playing different hats. You had, um, you know, which superpower do I play at each time? But 
how can we use that when getting the most out of others as leaders with dealing with other people? How can we use our knowledge of ourselves and our strengths in that situation? Yeah, I think that knowing what card to play when, when you're working with others, mm. <laughs> is going to supercharge these superpowers of yours. Um, because other people in your orbit, or we often use the term sphere of influence, are going to have different roles and different orientations with you. And we can use the Belden as a bit of a, a starting point into understanding what other people's motivations and values are and how we can connect with them in a way that's most meaningful to them so that we're getting the most out of the people that we are working with. Um, kind of no matter what level you're, you're working with them on. So take out hierarchy for a second and just come to different people are going to have different natural orientations. And, and the Belden can be a good insight into that. So for example, when I look at um, an issue that I see a lot with someone who's strong at Shaper, mm -hmm. they sometimes have an issue around pace when they're working with others. Because the, the benefit of what they bring to the table is this get her done, charge it up, bring the sense of urgency, let's go, let's knock down barriers. And that is a very high-paced role, naturally. And not all the roles lean that way. Mm -hmm. So when someone strong at Shaper is going to be working with someone who might have a slower pace, and some of the roles are, are a natural slower-paced fit, like monitor evaluator, for example, needs that time in order to come up with the best conclusions to actually process and go through their analytical, critical thinking flow. They need a slower pace in order to be most effective. Um, or someone strong at implementer, for example, is going to be very driven by having a clear process, following procedure, um, and following a structure that really works for them. And suddenly shifting that could, could um, you could be running into some barriers from other people there. So knowing that if you lean one way and people lean another way, and there's a few elements that we can look at this for, but just pace is one of them right now. Knowing that when you're working with someone else, you might need to adjust your style a little in order to get the most out of them and to better reach them as well. We think about it like, like an elastic band. Ooh, so we I want love to... your analogies. Sorry, let me just sit down and come <laughs> to me. All over them. This is... <laughs> There's the education training coming into, into being. Um, but if you think about an elastic band, if you stretch a little, it'll still be nice and strong. So you can say, okay, I've got this, I've got this fast pace. I'm going to stretch just a little bit to just slow down, to make sure that my team's on board, to make sure that I've got everyone pointed in the right direction and knowing that we're all charging the same way. And then, okay, I'm going to release that elastic band and go back to my normal pace. Of, of high pace. You can stretch that little bit and be very effective with the stretch, but if you stretch it too far, you're actually going to be under great stress, and a very stretched out elastic band is actually going to lose strength, and it could break. Yeah. So you've got this situation where if you stretch too far, if you now try to, as a strong shaper, go to a monitor evaluator pace and go super slow in really analyzing things, it's actually gone too far. So we need to find that happy stretch yeah. that you can stretch into, but that you can come back to, that doesn't cause you undue amounts of stress or strain, but that is really leveraging your talents in the best way. And we can think about that for things like pace, we can think about it for things like comfort with change. Some roles are yeah. naturally going to uh -huh. be burn the house down and some are going to be naturally, no, let's do the same thing the same, same way for 100 years. Um, we can think about it for level of detail. You know, with my specialist orientation, I need a very intense level of detail to be comfortable with something. When I go work with Max, who's my boss, who leans more coordinator, I actually have to sit back before I go talk to him and almost make an executive briefing that's focused at this higher level yeah. so that he can come in at the right level for him so that we can have the right kind of conversations. So there's all these factors that kind of yeah. lead into where can you flex? Where is it useful to flex? Where can others flex to meet you? But how do you still maintain this key authenticity of what drives you and, and what, what you bring to really help the team? Thank you for that, because I think that's answered a few questions here. Um, the conversation between Ian and Rod as well. Um, Rod saying that 
here's a strong shepherd, is learn a lot of, um, developed a wider range of leadership styles by recognizing that he can achieve more if he uses different behaviors. And it gets yeah. easier with the practice. And you don't, but the thing is, you don't want to do it so much that you're no longer you. You don't want to do it so that the band does snap, do you? It is learning that actually, how do you stretch each time to become a little bit, you know, more useful, like you said, the pace or perhaps change yeah. or what yeah. have you, to be able to accommodate, listen, and make the most of, not so that you become not you. And that, that, that's and crucial. You don't want to change too yeah. much. And what is your natural orientation? So I know that under pressure, if you think about shaper versus coordinator leadership styles, yeah. when I'm under stress, I go right back to shaper. And knowing that about myself means that I know how to manage it when the stressful situations come up with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got nice ground rules with my team and they all know that's the way that I'm going to lean. But being aware of your natural tendencies and, and that those are more likely to pop out under pressure, under strain, under stress. Um, can be really helpful in then managing yourself in the tricky situations that are that are bound to come up. Yeah, and I think that's the other interesting one, isn't it? Is the more you spend analysing and understanding yourself and how you do behave in situations, yeah. the less you're going to surprise your team. The less suddenly something comes out of the blue, doesn't it? Because you understand it, you know it, and you know it's it's far more um, allowed, I suppose, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, so we've got a few questions here. I have a question about the measurable argument. I often get a question about the feedback from other, how it's being weighted. Okay, so that's, you know, the feedback from the observers. Liz, we've still got your report on the screen, actually. Shall we just, <laughs> yeah. um, shall we go back? Because obviously it's important that um, each of the people that we ask to observe us, you want to know how much they're weighted. It's about a third really. So if you look at the fact that each person, so each here, Maggie, Deb, um, Debbie, Renzi, Lorraine, Max and, and Melody, each of their contributions is going to be about a third of the, the self-perception. So it's not, it, one person doesn't have complete dominance. It's a case of everybody is being able to feed back and their voice is being heard, but not too much or not too little. And, you know, we, we've learned over the years that this is really the, the, the best, um, to have there. So thank you very much. Um, and, and Joe, if you're a data nerd like me, which might be where this question is coming from, um, the, the, we have an observer assessment that shows you actually the raw scores that your observers gave you on these behaviors. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about measurable, we can actually get really tactical and tangible with how many people said what about you. So it's less about the weighting, but you can, which we just talked about, but you can see here these kind of raw scores of what do people see as your behaviors? What do people see as your superpowers? And, and what are you missing that might actually be helpful yeah. to charge up to, to make you more effective as well? I think this is beautiful, actually. I think this has lent itself really well to going on to this page here, isn't it? Because we're not just one type we're a whole mixture as we keep going but then these words then add another layer don't they onto that as well so you've got your mixture of your two more behaviors and then the words that you use and these are the ones which is the cholesterol check in a way isn't it you can say right i really need to work on my coordinator role i would like that to be um more effective i know that people don't see me as that confident and relaxed so what can i do and again we go back to what we talked about right at the beginning this ability to learn the ability to do what's needed of us and think yeah. how can I make that slightly stronger how can I make that go up the list and we can measure this because then we can ask everybody in six months time and if it has gone up that's fantastic you can see that what you're doing has had a tangible benefit absolutely any words that you'd like to see go up the list there Lindsay um, I can't see where consultative is but I'm not seeing it in the top and I think for my role Mm -hmm. um being Two very tips. aware of asking more questions rather than doing more talking when i'm working with my team would be something that i'm working on so that would definitely be one that i would say i think i want to make sure that that's getting bumped up in this moment yes. that i'm ah two yes Number two is two. not enough that okay. is not helping me that is not serving me so so that's an actual tactical thing that i can look at and i can say okay if i want to come up with 
two strengths that I want to improve and maybe two weaknesses that I want to manage from this report. What am I going to do between now and the next time I do a report to see what I'm actually working on to meet my goals? And for me, in, in, the, in the place where I am, this is telling me maybe I'm doing a little more talking than listening, and maybe I do need to ask others for, for their input before I put mine forward. So, you know, knowing that, that there are these behaviors that we can actively measure and, and knowing what behaviors you'd like to improve on to to resonate with the rest of your strengths that you bring to the table. This can be a really clear way where, regardless of team roles, you can put this new lens on it, this extra lens, to say, yeah. but what are the specific behaviors that I can work on? Do you know, I really like that. So what you're talking about really is a sort of a tactical plan, isn't it? A tactical plan Absolutely. for your behaviors, isn't it? It's, and sorry, you said again, two strengths, two weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, that's a starting point. So I would say you need to figure out your own plan of what, what resonates for you. But a, a basic starting point that we often use in our work is what are two strengths you want to work on? And they can be very tactical behaviors like this, mm -hmm. or they can be even things like, I didn't know that I was strong at the plant role. I need to start doing more of that, right? So it can be the more, the more general big picture. Um, and then two weaknesses to make sure that you're managing, whether it's yourself. So, you know, on my on my previous Belvern report, I had a very high score for territorial. And now it's come down to about two points. So I can actually say, okay, good. I did I did figure out how to allay that one a little bit. Or with your other weaknesses, how you can leverage the rest of your team to yeah. cover off for you so that it doesn't matter. So we've got this little thing that we use which is you want to play to your strengths wherever possible, and then manage your weaknesses so they become irrelevant. So I have a definite weakness around um, uh, final attention to detail. It is not my, my capacity. But I've got such strong team members at it that no matter how hard I worked on it, I would never be half as good as them on a bad day even, <laughs> getting this, this attention to detail. So I've set myself up that before I send out a presentation to a client, I've got my team who's got my back, who's got my pocket, who has other strengths that I have um, that can cover off for my weaknesses so that they become irrelevant at this point because the, the work is still getting done to the standard it needs to, leveraging everyone's strengths in the most effective way. So it's not just about the leaders themselves understanding themselves, it's about the team as well, isn't it? Everybody, yeah. if you, as long as you, is, you need to know the strengths and the weaknesses of the teams and the people around you to make sure, like you said, you, the, the weaknesses become irrelevant because and you've built you that wonderful team up around you. You got it. And once you know everyone's strengths, you can you can play to them. You can maximize any scarce resources that you've got on the team so that you've got real like appreciation of diversity of the different strengths on your team. And people become more engaged from doing this because people are doing the work that they love to do, the work that motivates them, the work that gets them more engaged. So, you know, we've been working in a, um, uh, a, a an organization that has uh, a really high turnover on one of their teams. And we were seeing like 70% of people leaving this team every year. And we came in and, you know, not rocket science, we helped leverage people into doing work that was playing to their strengths. And all of a sudden, the same people are back on the team every year. And we've cut that turnover down to something maybe like 20%. Wow. It's a big difference for this team to know that when you leverage people to playing to their strengths, they actually want to come to work every day. Wouldn't that be a lovely place to be? <laughs> Wouldn't it just? Some more questions for you, um, Lindsay. Um, so how can you get a detailed Belbin analysis? It's, it's being shown well, very simply, this is Belbin. Um, if you've done Belbin and you've just guessed or you just filled up a questionnaire and added it up yourself, that's not Belbin. This is Belbin. It's finding out not just how you see yourself, but also how others see you to get this wonderful, rich, I think there's something like 14 pages of advice mm. and feedback that you can either take on yourself or you as a coach or as a HR or L&D management professional, you can help other people go through and as Lindsay does, sit down and coach. And uh, Lindsay was saying she's already got some like 55 sessions booked for January and she's like, ah. <laughs> Um, but this is where the real power comes in because you've got such a rich amount of, of information. You can get it directly from the website or we'll let you know. 
Um, other questions. Some team roles have more stretch than others. Discuss. Absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, know, and knowing that about yourself, I think, is really important. And sometimes can you take off the less stretchy hat in favor of a stretchier hat that might do you more good in terms of getting you to the place that you want to be in the future? So I work with a lot of leaders who are having trouble getting buy-in with their teams. Mm -hmm. And so we talk a lot about, well, did you actually involve them along the way to get their buy-in? Are they actually part of the process, right? So knowing that, uh, yeah, some of the roles might just not flex as well and being very conscious then about, is this a time that I'm going to flex or is this a time that I need to stick to my my tight elastic band <laughs> of not moving to get the best results and really being true to not just what's best for me, but what's going to be best for the team and for the goals that I'm trying to get to and finding out the magical balance of that, which does get easier over time. But yeah, definitely acknowledging that some roles aren't going to stretch as much as others. Important. And then it becomes perhaps more of a conscious stretch doesn't it it is because some you can do and i would say actually lindsay i don't know if you'd agree with this because we've both been obviously we've had several belvin reports of our own over the years is that the more you use it the more you understand the language of belvin the impact of others how to it just generally becomes easier over time doesn't it so what wasn't very stretchy right at the very beginning is once you start using the language and understanding getting that feedback from the impact that you're having it does mm -hmm. become a little easier. You also fall into kind of scripts or pre-predicted behavioral patterns. So now every time I work with my boss, I don't have to think, okay, I'm going to put on my coordinator hat. I'm going to take off my specialist hat. That's just now the way that we work together. So a lot of those things that are very, you have to be tactical and strategic and decide to do it ahead of time. Um, they start to become habit. They start to ingrain themselves. And then you don't have to worry about them every single time you do them. They become the way that you do operate moving forward. So the top tip there is the more you immerse yourself into Melbourne, the easier it becomes. Lindsay, we've run out of time. We've run out of time. Oh, no. It was always oh, no. going to happen. It was always going to happen. I just quickly looked at the clock. I thought, oh, my goodness, it's five o'clock. <laughs> which means everyone wants to go home in the UK. Um, although you've just started your day there. I'm just going to summarise because I started writing things down, actually, then I remembered we were recording it. Um, so what you've really talked to us about, let me go through here, is the fact that you need to find out what cards you have. That's the yeah. first thing. Find out what's in your deck of cards. Find out your strengths. Find out what other people think your strengths are. And then learn how to play a leadership role using the cards that you have without wanting to pick somebody else's up because you think it's a better hand. It isn't. Use yours through the lens of leadership. And you've got all these pages of the Belbin Report that, that can allow you to do that. Learn. You've got to learn as well. You've got to grow. It isn't just now. You know, we, we need to look at these words. And like you said, it's about having the goal in mind. What is it that the team, the organisation, what does it need me to do? What is that final objective? Mm. It's be able, and it's measurable, therefore, isn't it? Because if you keep going through your Belbin, you can see the effects that this change is having. One mm. thing that I particularly love is um, find out your superpowers. Look at that page of your report, your working stars report. Look at that combination, because we're not just one thing. Um, we are a wonderful combination of, of all nine. Find those combinations on this page. There's our top four. What are your superpowers and how are you going to be losing, using those? But remember, great responsibility is also there as well, isn't it? Um, so to make sure you know the impact that you're having as you're whirling around. We talked about versatility. It's knowing mm -hmm. when to play each one, when to play its superpower, when to play your, your cards. And that lovely elastic band analogy, I love that, of learning how to stretch, but not so much that you no longer become authentic. My goodness, we haven't even got to the end of our list of things that we were going to talk about, Lindsay, but I'm going to have to. <laughs> I love that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. What we will do is, um, just for everybody who said, but you haven't answered my question, I'm going to screenshot everything um, before we leave and to make sure that we answer each one individually if we haven't already done so yeah 
one last takeaway, Lindsay, for everybody. One last top tip. Hmm. Um, the, the Belden report is not about are you good or bad at something, but that everyone has all nine roles and can play all of them. And some of them are going to come more naturally for you. And if you can find those roles and spend the most time in them, you will uh, be doing work that you enjoy doing every day. You'll be motivated. It'll align with your values. And it'll be bringing the best of you to all the work that you do. And other people can see that. And it's going to be a way that you can use your superpowers to then enable others to find their superpowers as well. And I think if everybody is working on that level of who am I actually and how can I bring this to my work life, um, I think you're gonna have a whole bunch of people walking around who are, who are really engaged and charged up and excited to do their work because it's actually just the best representation of themselves. And if you ask me what kind of leader you'd wanna work for, I'm not gonna say, oh, someone who's coordinator, someone who's shaper. I'm gonna say someone who's bringing their true selves to the workplace. Thank you. Somebody who is bringing their true self to the workplace. That's what we're all looking for, isn't it? That's the goal. That's what makes you an authentic leader. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, just thank you. And thank you to everybody oh, you. who's joined in. I would just like to say that I'm saying thank you, but looking at the comments, I've been told to ask you back. Um, <laughs> so you will be part of our 2021 <laughs> webinar series, Lindsay, because people have really um, got quite a lot from that. So um, don't okay. think so you're escaping. An adiento, not an au revoir. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you that again. Will be it. Absolutely, we will. So thank you so much, everybody, um, for joining us. I am going to be doing copies and pastings of all of this. Um, go and have a wonderful rest of the week. Um, keep safe. And yeah, we will be in touch with both the recording and also details of the one we have got in December and when Lindsay's coming back again. Do you know, I can't wait until I Lindsay. Can I come and spend some time with you guys? Honestly, I'm missing you so much. Yeah, um, we are too. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not the same. I'm, I'm doing a, 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 presenting at a conference in Prague tomorrow, but it's not Prague, is it? No, it's here. Oh, it's yeah. here. <laughs> it's but at least we get to do it in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> We just have to keep talking. We will. Actually, one question that does keep coming up, and maybe yeah. this should be the focus of um, the, next, the next webinar, is all about what's the difference between leadership and management? And how does it oh. But I think I didn't ask the question because it's such a big question. Yeah, I didn't want to, to go in there. <laughs> um, and also, there's so many different answers. I, I don't think there is one answer, actually, to that. But... Put your thinking hat on. Perhaps we could have a discussion yeah. around that yeah. next time. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Leadership versus management. Yeah, right now. Right now. Management's about delegating, isn't it? So more so, it's more work focused. Um, but we can discuss this. Yeah. Got some practical yeah. questions. Yeah. Don't worry, we will get back to all of you on those. We will. Um, perfect. How do you encourage team members in a new team to identify and tick weaknesses? That's a nice question, Paul. That is a nice question. Um, we know going in that people are often going to be nice. <laughs> and not your best suit on. many weaknesses. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so any weaknesses that you do see, you want to put an extra layer on them of saying, wow, someone really went above and beyond to share with me something that they think is a weakness that is helpful feedback that I can now take on and figure out how to deal with. Um, once people have, have experienced something like this before, um, they de then tend to be a little more likely to share more weaknesses in the future. Um, and what we find is that often the barrier is not knowing how the report's gonna be used. 
So we're very clear on our confidentiality practices and then also on that the, the, the results of the Belbin report aren't used for performance review, for do you get your bonus this year, are you being hired or fired or promoted, that it's, it's definitely towards your own personal development and that any feedback you do get from these folks is a gift. And with that lens in mind, the people that you're going to use as observers are generally the people that know you the best. Yeah. So if you're choosing your six-ish people who really know you really well, they probably have seen some weaknesses too. And if you can just have a little conversation with them saying, look, this isn't about am I good or bad, but it's about getting more information, more feedback, that'll often spin it towards um, eliciting a little more along the weakness side from the folks that you're working with as well. As well as just putting it out to them, you know, I say to my team all the time, we know I've got the territorial thing, so call me on it when you see it happening. They're now more likely to take territorial every time they do my Belvin, right? Because we've talked <laughs> about it. It's a thing. It's a non-defensive arena that I'm working on. Um, so, so, so part of it is showing that you're receptive um, and then also setting up people to understand how the reports will be used. Perfect. I think you've answered that beautifully. I always say as well, don't necessarily do it initially because um, we have all got our best suits mm. on. Maybe it's time. I mean, you can get first impressions, can't you? But if you're talking about weaknesses, mm. and that sense, perhaps give it a few, you know, a little while so people get to really know each other. You know, yeah. they've, they've come in as them as opposed to I'm new. Um, so, so give it some time as well. I think people are, are more comfortable to do that. Okay. Yes, I can confirm that you will get all of this as a rerun. Don't worry um, for people who are coming in late. We've already finished. Uh, right, Lindsay, I'm now going to say goodbye, farewell. If we all can catch up in the next couple of minutes just on our normal Zoom link, that would be lovely. But otherwise, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll see you soon and have a lovely Christmas. <laughs>